And welcome back to PCC Connection. I'm Michael Engel, your host. Hopefully you've been uh, tuned in. We are having a special out of the studio segment here of PCC Connection. Uh, I'm very proud and uh, very honored to be here with members of the USS Pueblo crew. And uh, as we just finished talking to Don Bailey, uh, talking to another uh, individual that's part of the USS Pueblo crew, and his name is Alvin Plucker. Alvin, welcome. You're welcome, thank you very much. Um, you had a very interesting job on the USS Pueblo. Uh, you were a navigator. I was a quartermaster. And quartermaster. Uh, and I want to talk about that because that was part of this intrigue, this Cold War story. And the North Koreans to this day will, will declare that the USS Pueblo was not in international waters, but rather was in North Korean territory, and they had every right. Now, uh, obviously, I, you know for a fact that you were in international waters. Can you talk a little bit about what you were doing as the navigator and, and take us even to January 23rd, the day that uh, the ship was seized. Okay, uh, we, were, we were doing oceanographic research as a cover-up, and it was to, uh, uh, we had made a, a trip up to Vladivostok, and we're, we're heading down the coast of North Korea when we were, we were first, first confronted by some of their, uh, a trawler, kind of curious about who we was and what we were doing. And, and we continued to do our research within international waters. And, uh, and then the next day we were confronted, approached by one of their, uh, their gunships. Actually, I, I believe it was a, a torpedo boat. Oh, it was at the Soviet sub chaser? Yeah. Okay, all right. And, uh, and they uh, come out and, and uh, they uh, Surveyed the scene and 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 made a couple of approaches on us, and then decided to go back into into port. And we thought, well, that was we were warned that such incidents could happen. A certain level of harassment is yeah. expected. Okay. Right. And and the next thing you know, why why they come out with more boats, with more demands, and obviously they were becoming hostile, which was making making us really nervous. I, uh, I at the time was on the bridge for all that duration up till the point uh, that I, I got off my watch and, uh, and I was laid below uh, when, when they actually decided that they were gonna, they were gonna um, uh, uh, demand certain aspects of the thing. My memory's not awful good anymore, but sure. uh, they commenced to uh, ask our identity and what nationality we was, and, and our signalman hoisted uh, uh, by request of Commander Booker the, the ensign, which the ensign, by the way, isn't flown all the time because, you know, they cost money and, and the winds and stuff will just rip them all to pieces. Okay. And, and so, uh, and that, that, that really got them excited, and when they seen that they had a, a, a parent U.S. ship. But you did declare you were in international waters, Yes, correct? we did. And uh, and so and anyway, they says, well, uh, uh, what is your intentions? And and of course, uh, Commander Booker says, well, our, uh, we are doing oceanographic research, and we will depart the area. And and they says, well, uh, uh, they were they were demanding to know really what our really mission was, and and the commander. Uh, says, well, we're, we're departing the area. Thank you for your consideration. We're out of here, you know. And uh, and it obviously uh, that got them really excited, and they started firing 50 calibers on the on the bridge first as a warning shot, which they they injured Commander Booker in that first round and shot up the bridge pretty good. Let me ask and, you about that. Let me interrupt you, Alvin, just a moment and ask you about that. Um, you know, you were a young guy. How old were you when you were in 68? Uh, I was 22. I was all, already had served three tours in Vietnam, two months left of a four-year enlistment, and, I, and the captain I worked for on the USS Hornet, mm -hmm. he says, you really don't want to go anywhere. You want to finish up your naval time on this ship, don't you? And I said, yeah, and he got a hold of Bupers, 
and he requested that I remain on, on board, and Bupers denied him, saying we were all handpicked, we were all selected, we were to go. So I went, and, and naturally... But you certainly had heard gunfire before, after yeah. having done some tours in Vietnam. Yep. Was there something unique about that, the fact that you were on this 179-foot ship that you heard that metal ripping through? Those well, the, I was used to that because yeah. I, I was uh, a TAD on a, on a gunboat for a little while fill in. Okay. And uh, actually it was a punishment for, for uh, uh, they sent me off on leave and I missed ship's movement. And it, I think it, when they come back, they didn't know what to do with me for a little bit, so they put me in a, in place of a coxman and, and you know so I did that for a while but and I was used to the, the 50 caliber fire oh, okay um, I, I want to take you fast forward a bit if we could uh, you've been captured and you're now a prisoner of war in North Korea um, tell me about a typical day for Alvin Plucker as a prisoner of war if well, there was such a thing as a typical day. Yeah, there's really, well, it was, a, I'll tell you one thing that was very typical. If it wasn't so exciting that they threatened to kill you, uh, either shooting you in the head or turn you over to the guards or whatever, then, then if they left you alone a day, they bored them. Uh, you, could, you, weren't, you weren't permitted to talk freely. Uh, in the beginning, everything was really rough. You you really didn't have any options. You just sat in a chair all day long and worried about why your America hadn't come and got you yet. We we the first week or so we would not give up on the U.S. They're going to come and get us. They're going to come and get us. And and then after some time, they're not going to come and get us. You know. And and then you had that let down feeling as. And, and obviously we didn't know all the things that were going to happen to us till the in, court of inquiry come out, but that, you know, that Commander Booker had actually been denied all this help all along. But um, let me ask you about Captain Booker, your commanding officer. What kind of man was Captain Booker? Well, he was pretty much a, a renegade type of, of submarine officer. And he really loved subs. He was an executive officer on one of the subs. And um, he really wanted his own command of a sub and they put him on the Pueblo and he wasn't at first too happy with it. And then the conditions of the boat, you know, were so run down and so bad. It was nothing but a AKL converted Which army is a cargo, cargo ship. Army cargo vessel that we got back three of them from uh, from uh, the the South Koreans and converted them, and this was their Star Wars thing in those days, you might say, and um, and it took forever to to build this ship and and improvise it, and the Sharful thing is that he requested many times for adequate artillery and and adequate destructive devices for classified material and. It was and always denied. Everything, everything was, everything was denied, and told him he wouldn't have a use for it. And he asked about, about protection, and he says, "Well, there's no immediate protection. You won't need it anyway." Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was quite a, Commander Commander Booker fought his way through a lot of red tape, even bought some of the stuff with his own money, because uh, the admiral in charge didn't see fit to have this stuff on the ship. And um, so Commander Booker, uh, I don't think he was really happy with the ship all along and his duty, but it was like a submarine anyway above, above waterline because yeah. in Surface rough water yeah. we just died, you know, and bad, everything that was on it didn't work right, you know, so. Let me ask you, during your 11 months of imprisonment, um, Booker played a key role in keeping morale up, is that right? Absolutely. Never Absolutely. let you guys down. Never. And he communicated with us. He kept us on the line. Uh, the, even though there was a few what we call old salts that, that, that from the Korean War and stuff, carryovers, that knew quite a bit about what was going on. But, um, but Commander Booker would, would hand down things. They're going to do this and tell them this. And uh, they're going to do that and tell them that, you know, and constant, confuse constant them. Constant directives. And, yeah. And, and eventually, you know, we were all doing name, rank, and serial numbers and just getting beat to no end. Yeah. And uh, he decided that, you know, 
uh, that, that name, rank, and serial numbers with all the captured evidence they had, it would, really didn't apply. It wouldn't matter. Yeah, and you got to understand that the first people that, uh, when we were captured, that they come after, of course, was the quartermasters because they wanted the whole world to know that we were in their territorial waters and not international waters because that would make them the bad guy. Right. And we denied it. I and Charlie, all the uh, uh, Captain Booger had passed down that we, to tell, it, tell them all the time that we were in international waters. And, and we would tell yep, and we would tell them and tell them and tell them and they would beat you and beat you and beat you and say no you aren't no that's your lie you lie you know and and so eventually you say well whatever you want to do I guess you know <laughs> is there one thing that stuck out in your mind if you're fluctuating between fear and boredom was there something that you continually thought about back home I don't, and, and it could be anything, a favorite book or a movie or a person, I family. I, I grew up in a, in a household where, where my father was rather abusive. And so I spent all my time away from home. Uh, I, I grew up on a trout fish hatchery and, and I went out and I hunted arrowheads. And I, killed, I found my first arrowhead and killed my first rattlesnake at age of five. And, and I have been doing all of that for 65 years now. And I learned how to live on my own. So, so when they were when they would beat on me or something, you know, it just it's just like being at, at home. Well, I had all these dreams because I was an artifact collector, right. and uh, amateur archaeologist, and and I I knowing what I knew and knowing how to be able to handle loneliness, uh, uh, I think I did pretty good. I think I did pretty good. I think you did too. Daily life, uh, I could accept daily life uh, under stress. And, uh, and uh, the sad thing about most of this, though, as you well know, that we, we lost a tremendous amount of, of weight at first because they didn't feed us. They, they uh, figured that the U.S. was coming in and we were probably going to be dead anyway. So, And, uh, you know, I got all the way down to about 98 pounds probably in a few weeks. And... Um, only weighed a hundred. Yeah, but I weighed 130 then. Anyway, 29 or something, and, and um, so yeah, yeah. Let me ask you one final thing, Mr. Plucker. Do you hold bitterness still? Is this something that you think about frequently about Absolutely. North Koreans? Yes, I do. I I am so disappointed in the U.S. Navy because they would not accept that they put us on trial when we come back and would not accept responsibility for an error that they made, not the error that we made. They did not uh, uh, apologize to us. I'm still waiting for an apology. They, they have never done any of this thing in public. And uh, I have been to Congress and, and, and other places uh, to, with petitions and stuff to try to, uh, try to uh, put pressure and it, to no avail, uh, as you well know, NSA did, uh, when we were in Vermont in, on a reunion, they did come up and, and they, they did give us a letter of acknowledgement and, and stuff, but for the CTs because of the way that they were, had been treated, but, but the Navy never has come forth. Uh, we have a lot of high-ranking Naval followers. But that doesn't get the, the doesn't core. Doesn't make it happen. Uh -uh. Perhaps that will arrive someday. Perhaps. Perhaps. Been visiting with Alvin Plucker, who is a navigator, quartermaster uh, on the USS Pueblo. And uh, again, we want to thank you for your time. And uh, not just pleasure. for today, but we also want to thank you for your time of service. And it's important to have these stories told. And so. Uh, we're, and we're also pleased to have you here in Pueblo. Thank you very much. Again, you're watching a special segment of PCC Connection. I'm Michael Ingram, host. Uh, please stick around. We've got more crew members and more stories. We'll be right back.